this idea of spooky harmony, I want to think with you very quickly about what it means to be in community. And what I want you to think about is the difference between this. I want you to think about the difference between tribe and community. Because we oftentimes think that uh, community is that place of like-mindedness, that place of, of where I know I'll be safe, I know people will think like me, I know that uh, people will look like me, but that's really a different kind of uh, community. That's really tribe. That's really uh, tribalism, which is very prominent in our culture right now. We're sort of uh, caught up in tribal identities, it seems like. But this thing about community is completely different. I don't know if you, if you know the story prior to what was read in our text today in the second chapter of Acts. This is where um, uh, the disciples all gather with any number of peripheral sorts of individuals who have been followers of Jesus. And they gather together in this place where there's all sorts of folks from other backgrounds, uh, from other countries and other cultures. So they're all speaking different languages when suddenly they begin to understand each other. And as the, as the text says, that the Holy Spirit came down upon them and they began to understand one another in each other's own tongues uh, or each other's language. Um, there's a lot to unpack in that particular scene, and I'm really going to focus a little more on this phrase that's in our text today, this experience of harmony that was present with all this diversity, there was this experience of harmony. And what I want to suggest to you is that it's not because they all decided to think exactly alike, but it's because of something quite different, but also, I think, uh, very much a part of what the Holy Spirit is all about when we try to think about the Trinity. Um, I want to tell you a quick story. Um, the, I'm taking a group, as you know, of uh, um, about 28 people to Ireland coming up in... Uh, August, the first two weeks of August. And part of our mission on this trip will be a number of things. We're looking at sacred spaces all throughout the southwest, uh, southeast, and then up into the northeast part, up into uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland. But what we're going to do in the middle of the trip is we're going to be at the border of Northern Ireland and the Republic. And we're, there's a place there in Clones, a little tiny village there, where we are going to participate in building an international peace labyrinth. Uh, of course, there have been, uh, been peace now between... Uh, uh, Northern Ireland between the Protestants and Catholics and the uh, conflicts, the troubles as they've called them. There's been an element of peace for some time now, and yet there are still these tensions that exist. And I read this story uh, not too long ago, which reminded me of the fact. I experienced it personally when I was in Ireland on, in uh, 2013 at the Sneem International Storytelling Festival, and after each performance, I would sit down with some of the locals who wanted to offer to buy me a pint or, or coffee or tea because they really enjoyed the story. A little side note here, when I did the Born to be Wild rocking out on the ukulele story that I do, all the young adults wanted to invite me for tea or a pint or something like that. I, I, none of the other traditionalists would talk to me. <laughs> But then the day before, when I did stories about Texas and tumbleweeds and Indians, all of the traditionalists came over and wanted to buy me tea and stuff. So it was an interesting kind of mix of cultures there. But one thing happened on the last night as we were sitting down sharing stories was that um, I was sitting at the table with someone from the Republic and someone from Northern Ireland. Uh, it was a younger gentleman from Northern Ireland with his wife, and I'm guessing um, he was probably 6'3", 225. I mean, he looked like your classic rugby player. Um, and then the other gentleman was an older gentleman who was um, one of the performers at the table from the, su from the south, from, from Cork, County Cork. Um, and the conversation began amicably enough, but as things wore on and the evening wore on, the conversation turned to the troubles. It turned to the conflicts that existed between the Protestants and Catholics, that existed between uh, 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 Northern Ireland and, and England or Britain. And and at some point, it was inevitable that it came out that the young man looked at the older man and said, you left us in our time of need and abandoned us. Now, it's been, I don't know how many years since the peace accords that they've had, and yet this tension was still deep. It's still deeply rooted in the stories they tell. And that's where things have to be challenged, I think, sometimes. Anais Nin, uh, the writer, had said that we don't tell the stories we've heard, we tell the stories as we are. We don't tell the stories as we've heard, we tell them as we are. And that's where we sometimes have to challenge ourselves or be challenged is to find a different way of hearing and telling these stories. 
That's what community is all about. So, so I read this not too long ago by Patrick, uh, Patrick uh, Otama, who, was, who teaches. He's also the director of the uh, 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 International um, Peace Center in Belfast. But he uh, was telling this story about talking to uh, preschoolers. And this was only a couple of years ago. And he said, uh, while teaching last year with a primary school class here in Belfast, a child said to me, Patrick, let me ask you a question. God loves us, right? And he says, avoiding the complexity of anthropomorphic projections of human experiences onto God, I chose to answer from the heart and from what I hope. And I said, yes. And then the child continued and she asked, and God made all of us, didn't he? And once again, I avoided the anthropomorphic discussions of he and the decision to talk about what does that exactly mean to say made, and I said, yes. <laughs> so tell me this, she said, why did God make Protestants? <laughs> and when I asked her why she was asking me this, she said, well, they hate us, and they hate him. He says, I'd been amused at the start, but I wasn't amused anymore because I wondered what stories were educating this funny, witty, engaging, innocent enough, lively child. The child learned some, understood some human lessons and had, heard, and had learned them well from wherever she was finding her source. They hate us. They hate our God. They are unknown, and the hollow story we tell is that they are also unknowable. There's this understanding that goes along with a tribal understanding, which is we belong, which means consequently someone else doesn't. It's a struggle that every community faces, that every group of people faces, that every culture faces. We face it within our church. Who belongs, who doesn't belong? What's, who's, who's acting appropriately, who's acting inappropriately? The early church struggled with it so much so that Paul often tried to remind them, in spite of their differences, the apostle Paul would say, find what brings peace and focus on that. Whatever brings love, focus on that. Whatever brings kindness, focus on that. Whatever brings justice for others, focus on that. Because this constant tension was focused on me or mine or who's like me, or if we want to think neurobiologically, what makes me feel safe? What makes me feel uncomfortable? I'd rather feel safe. But that's, again, not necessarily what the gospel is all about, is it? There's a saying in Irish, and I, and I swore I was going to try to pronounce this in Gaelic, erskiu acheli in venadinin. That's not even close. I'm glad there's nobody Gaelic in here. <laughs> it simply says we survive in the shelter of each other. It's an old Gaelic proverb. We survive in the shelter of each other. There's a, there's a wonderful word that the early church began to practice in its early Christian communities. And remember, Acts was written, what, in the late part of the first century, early part of the second century, and so the church had been around already, right? The church was already struggling with who it was in relationship to its Jewish history and Jewish connection. And then, of course, Gentiles were coming in from every direction as well, bringing all their cultural diversity. And so um, they began to have this phrase, that I'm gonna put it right between here, that's called perichoresis. Now, I want you to say that. Perichoresis, okay? Perichoresis, because I want you to remember. If you remember anything, that's what I'm going to have you remember as you leave here. And of course, you can impress everybody by saying, well, it's just our perichoresis. <laughs> uh, and try to figure out exactly what that, they'll figure out what that means. But what it meant to the early church, it's a Greek word that simply means, in a very casual way, the messy dance of the holy. That's in a casual way, because what it really means is it means that the Trinity is somehow, and the Trinity also, a concept that's not 
in the Bible, a concept that's an inferred kind of reality based on the early church's dialogue and debates and eventually the uh, Constantinople, the, the uh, Nicene Creed that happened in Constantinople in the early fourth century eventually sort of nailed down this notion of Trinity. But there was always this tension if Jesus was holy and yet Jesus was divine, if Jesus was sacred and yet Jesus was humid, if God is out there yet how can God be here as Jesus? There's all of this thing. And then there's this whole understanding in the Old Testament of something called Ruah, which in the New Testament was called Numa, right? You didn't know you were going to get all this good Greek stuff. So you got Hebrew, Aramaic, Ruah, and Numa. It basically means breath of God, but it also means spirit of God, and it also means wind, and it also means mystery. And so there was this sense of, well, then what, how do we understand this Trinity, this nature of the Trinity? Is it three separate gods as some of the early critics of the church began to accuse? You guys, you guys are poly polytheistic. You have three gods now. Um, or is it something else? Is it three personalities? You know, it's part of our tradition, in, in especially if you're in traditional church where we say the creed, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, we believe in the, uh, God the Father and Christ, Jesus Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit. But this perichoresis, is this try this attempt to understand what happens that somehow the threesome are all intertwined it is this messy entanglement of all three aspects as though they are in and outside and intermingled with one another and its purpose was to remind us that's the way of community when they have the holy spirit coming in the upper room, uh, at, uh, at the gathering of all of the disciples and all the strangers, this strangeness begins to happen. <coughs> it's messy. It's messy. How are we going to get along, all these different people? How are we going to get along? It's messy. It's, uh, it's complicated. There has to be this willingness to open up. There has to be this willingness to challenge, to be vulnerable with one another. And in that process of being open with one another, of experiencing this perichoresis, this willingness to get mixed up in the messiness, to simply say, it's messy, I don't get it, what's important? To go there, that's where we begin to experience unity. That's where we can actually begin to say, we are living in this really amazing harmony. Oh yeah, I completely disagree with those people about what they're saying on that. But that's not how I live my life. I live my life out of compassion, out of this willingness to share joy. It's a challenge. It's even more challenging when we think about Jesus telling us to love our enemies. It's perichoresis. It's this willingness to get there, to go messy, to show up, to simply struggle and be open, to be vulnerable. I can't believe the horrible, tragic stuff that continues to happen around the world. Manchester, London, Portland, wherever. It's not just ISIS. It's not just uh, the Taliban. It, it's, it's, also, it's also crazy folks in our own neighborhood. It's also angry people in our own communities. It's also radicals on all sorts of ends. It's also people in deep pain. I'll never forget the time I was held up at gunpoint at the Mott's 5 and 10 some years back. My first inclination, oddly enough, and I'm not saying this was anything heroic on my part because I really am kind of naive about these things. You just asked my wife. She's like, you are so clueless. He had a gun at your chest. And I was like, oh, that occurred to me like 10 minutes after he left. You know, my first inclination was I noticed how uncomfortable he looked. He just looked really uncomfortable. And my first inclination was to try to calm the moment down. I told that story last week about the family that was having the party and the guy came in and robbed them. The same kind of thing happened. Perichoresis is about that willingness to see something common, to see some common ground. Uh, D.L. Mayfield wrote this book called um, Assimilate or Go Home. She was a fundamentalist evangelical uh, Pentecostal and she knew that her calling was to convert as many Muslims as possible to Christianity. I've mentioned the book in the past. I don't know if any of you picked it up yet. But one of the things she says in this book is that she buried her, she planted herself in a struggling community in Portland 
with a newborn child and her husband and planted herself there with the distinct intention of bringing as many souls to Christ as she could and was showing the first time she gathered all the neighbors and all the burkas and all the different you know, uh, uh, rit ritual clothing and gathered them. They were mostly from Somalia. They were Muslims mostly from Somalia, but she gathered them and their families in the main room of this apartment and showed this film called The Jesus Film. And as she was showing it, she was waiting for that Holy Spirit to come in and just smack them, you know, slay them all and, and then convince them, you know, that this was the guy, this was the way. And by the end of the film, she noticed there was some discomfort, but there was genuine sort of respect. And finally, one of the elders looked at her afterward and said in his broken English, he said, Jesus, this Jesus, he is here. And then he kind of opened his arms. Muhammad, he said, Muhammad, he is here. And then he smiled, and then he left, and the others followed him out. She said she was a complete total failure. She said immediately she knew that she had just done something totally wrong, felt horribly shameful, allow, uh, a, a completely um, um, ineffective in her ministry. And, and then in the coming weeks, what she said was, as she unfolds this story in the book, is that the neighbors began to bring her food, and they began to invite her to their apartment to share in food. And eventually, she said what she discovered, and I'll, I'll just read her quote because it's, a fast, it's really fascinating what she says. She said, Slowly, I started to enter more fully into the world of my refugee friends. As the days and months blended into years, I experienced some strange paradoxes. The more I failed to communicate the love of God to my friends, the more I experienced it for myself. There is something that happens when we begin to open up our stories with one another and move past our opinions, move past our tribal identification and try to allow this whole messy dance of the holy to take us up, to transform things that are happening, to make that possible, to where we can get to that place where we can say me too, right? Where we can listen to one another deeply and say, I've suffered too, you've loved me too. You've experienced joy, me too. Where we can get to that place where we can say, I've experienced hate and triumph and loss and beauty, me too. Where we can find unity past the tribe and more in the present. This morning I decided that it would be really appropriate for us to celebrate community. I'm, I'm sorry, to celebrate, yeah, celebrate community with communion. But... I, I entitled it Family Feast. I've shared you with, with about my family and images of my family and the diversity that exists in my family and the potential nightmare of conflicts that's always present in my family. And, and it truly is. But there's some bond that keeps us together that I think is both centered around this idea of, okay, maybe we don't understand the same way. Maybe my God is a whole lot different than the way you see God. But there is something present here that we all seem to want to tap into. And we all experience pain together as well. So I think there are different ways that we find our bonds and we move past our significant differences. The animal rights activist, the card-carrying NRA member, the right-wing Republican, the left-wing Democrat, and the libertarian, the atheist, and the, and the, and the uh, fun, all of these different folks, gay and straight, all mixed in in a room and sitting around a table and decided there's something else. That's communitas. That's family. If we move past the difference, we'll find the common roots that, that bring us to our humanity and open us up to transformation. And I think that's what communion offers.